This is a slightly expanded version of a talk I prepared for our ICU team on cellular respiration and metabolism. Metabolism is an extremely broad topic, so this is going to focus on a conceptual understanding of how cells make energy from oxygen and simple substrates like glucose and fatty acids, as well as how they respond to an energy deficit. I find this topic very interesting as it underlies virtually all of critical care medicine, particularly shock, respiratory failure, nutrition, diabetes mellitus, and some elements of toxicology. As it's been a long time since high school and early medical school, I'm also going to go through some basic chemistry concepts that I found it useful to refresh. This will be quite a long video, so feel free to stop and start it or skip through chapters as you see fit. Essentially, we'll be looking at underlying chemistry principles, including potential energy, oxidation reduction reactions, principles of thermodynamics, and equilibrium reactions. We'll look at cellular adenylate energy charge, which is a way of quantifying the amount of ATP that a cell has to work with, as well as how ATP is preserved and recycled in the cell. We'll look at redox cofactors such as NAD and FADH. We'll look at types of fuel substrate and the role of oxygen in metabolism. We'll have a look at anaerobic glycolysis and lactate production, uh, as well as the different messaging pathways that regulate it. We'll have a look at mitochondria, the different pathways that take place inside the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. We'll see how this relates to respiratory quotient and energy yields for fat and carbohydrate metabolism and some of the medical applications of this. We'll also have a, a brief overview of ketone, ethanol and amino acid metabolism and other responses to energy depletion such as HIF and CERT pathway. So we'll start right at the beginning. What is energy? Energy is a quantifiable physical property that can be thought of as the ability to do work. The first law of thermodynamics states that the total energy in the universe is always conserved. If a system moves from a state with a high to a lower potential energy, it will release energy in some other form. In this case, it's gravitational energy becoming kinetic energy, which is a type of work. A state with a lower potential energy is more stable as it requires large energy input to return to its original state, as you can see with the ball example here. Therefore, the reaction is more favoured in the forward direction than backward. We'll now look specifically at chemical energy, such as in the combustion of methane in this example. Energy is used when chemical bonds are broken. This is sometimes known as activation energy and brings the elements to a transitional state. Energy is released when chemical bonds are formed. If the products have lower energy, or in this context, enthalpy, than the reactants, then energy is released as heat and the reaction is considered exothermic. An exothermic reaction is one that has a negative delta H, which is the change in enthalpy. Oxidation and reduction reactions, or redox, involve transfer of electrons and a change in oxidation state. They can be viewed as pairs of reactions, oxidation and reduction, and will often involve energy release if the electrons are more stable in their new configuration. Oxidation numbers are a way to keep track of the oxidation state of an atom in a molecule. The oxidation state can be thought of as analogous to charge. Neutral elements are zero, such as the oxygen in these oxygen molecules. But oxygen is normally minus two when it's combined with other elements. Hydrogen is typically plus one and the sum of the different oxidation numbers will equal the charge of the overall molecule. For example, it, the methane and the resulting carbon dioxide both have a charge of zero. To work out the charge of carbon in an organic molecule is a little bit trickier because it can take multiple oxidation numbers 
between minus 4 and plus 4. We'll look at this molecule, which is the amino acid alanine. You add to each carbon minus 1 for every bond to hydrogen. For example, minus 3 and minus 1. And then you add 1 for each bond to a more electronegative element, such as oxygen or nitrogen. And by bond, we mean if there's a double bond, you add plus 2. Bonds to carbons do not affect the oxidation number. From this, we can work out the carbons have oxidation states of minus 3, 0, and plus 3. And if we, we know the charges of oxygen are minus 2 and hydrogen are plus 1, and the overall molecule is 0, we could work out the nitrogen is minus 3. Going back to our methane example, the carbon has a charge of an oxidation number of minus 4, which has gone to an oxidation number of plus 4. The oxygen has gone from an oxidation number of 0 to an oxidation number of 2, minus 2. The carbon has been oxidized, or works as a reducing agent, while the oxygen has been reduced and is an oxidizing agent. The carbon, in this case, has donated two electrons to each atom of oxygen. As with our example of a ball on a hill, the products of an exothermic reaction have lower potential energy and are more stable, so the forward direction of the reaction is favoured. For example, the oxidation of iron to form rust occurs spontaneously. An endothermic reaction should be favoured in the reverse direction, but this is not always true. For example, an instant cold pack is a product that, consisting of a plastic bag containing ammonium nitrate crystals. It also contains a separate bag with water. When mixed, the two products cause a drop in temperature that can be used for first aid. To explain why this happens spontaneously, we need the second factor, entropy. Entropy is a measure of molecular disorder. The second law of thermodynamics states that any spontaneous process increases the entropy of a universe. And a process that increases the entropy of the universe can occur spontaneously. The third law of thermodynamics suggests that a crystal structure with a temperature of absolute zero has zero entropy. By comparison, gases and fluids have high entropy. So a crystal dissolving in a fluid is an entropically favorable condition because the entropy or disorder of the molecules increases, as you can see here. To explain when a reaction does occur spontaneously, you can combine enthalpy and entropy into a third concept, which is known as Gibbs energy or Gibbs free energy. When delta G is less than zero, a reaction can be spont will be spontaneous. The equation for Gibbs free energy or at least the change in Gibbs energy, is delta H minus temperature in Kelvin multiplied by the change in entropy. Whenever this equation is less than zero, the reaction will be spontaneous, as you can see in this table. This means that if an exothermic reaction causes an increase in entropy, it will always be spontaneous. And an endothermic reaction with a decrease in entropy will never be spontaneous. Endothermic reaction with an increase in entropy, such as the cold pack, or vice versa, an exothermic reaction with a decrease in entropy 
will depend on the temperature as seen in the equation. Many chemical reactions are reversible. For example, the reaction between reactants A and B and products C and D. Equilibrium occurs when the forward reaction equals the reverse reaction. The law of mass action suggests that the rate of reaction depends on the product of the concentrations of the reactants. The modern formulation uses the term activity rather than concentration. In medicine, this isn't something we tend to use, although it does become relevant, for example, in quantitative acid base analysis, where ions might have different activities than you'd expect based on their charge. The reaction quotient Q describes the current progress of reaction in terms of the product reactant concentration. As you can see the equation there, the equilibrium constant is Q when the reaction is at equilibrium. This means that the delta G is zero. Gibbs energy can be calculated based on Q and temperature. For any reaction, you can specify either a standard Gibbs energy, delta G, or the equilibrium constant. This is incredibly useful because you can convert between them. Reactions occur such that Gibbs free energy is minimized. As you can see here, Gibbs energy is zero at equilibrium. Changing the rate of reaction with a catalyst doesn't change the equilibrium. Enzymes are catalysts, so they change reaction rate, not equilibrium. Enzymes are used to regulate which reactions happen and can couple a favorable reaction to an unfavorable one. ATP hydrolysis to ADP is a favorable reaction that drives many energy dependent processes. Essential processes that require significant ATP hydrolysis include skeletal cardiac muscle contraction and ion pumps such as the NAK ATPase and the sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium transporter circa. It can also drive reactions indirectly through phosphorylation. For example, the glute glucose channel allows the flow of glucose from a high extracellular concentration to a low intracellular concentration. This is facilitated with the use of hexakinase, which phosphorylates glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. If you remove the product of reaction, then more of the reaction will shift to replace the product. Therefore, phosphorylating glucose to glucose 6-phosphate pulls more glucose into the cell. ATP functions as the energy currency of the cell. This can be quantified with ATP ADP ratio or adenylate energy charge. Adenylate energy charge or AEC is ATP concentration plus half ADP concentration over the concentrations of ATP, ADP and AMP. The reason that ADP is included on the top row is that ADP has some potential to drive reactions, but not as much as ATP. The goal of energy metabolism is to maintain adequately high ATP concentration to drive cellular functions. The creatine system is one example of how the cell preserves ATP concentrations in the event of sudden energy demand such as exercise. ATP and ADP exist in an equilibrium with creatine and creatine phosphate, facilitated by the enzyme creatine kinase. Creatine phosphate serves as a high energy store for AD ATP. When ATP is used, the equilibrium shifts and more ATP is made 
by changing creatine phosphate back to creatine. As you can see here, this can preserve ATP concentration significantly while the store of phosphocreatine or creatine phosphate decreases significantly. Essentially, it provides a buffer for ATP. Another mechanism uh, that can be used to increase the quantity of ATP when it is diminished is using the enzyme adenylkinase. When ATP is transformed to ADP and there is a surplus of ADP, two ADP molecules can be turned back into an ATP and an AMP. As we can see on the previous AEC equation, ADP still has some potential, and we've changed that potential from a mid-range to a high and a low for ATP and the AMP, because we can still do some use out of the ATP. If you have a look at this graph of adenylate energy charge based on the adenylkinase equation, these are the different species at different values of charge, and you can see the value of adenylkinase in this case. If it wasn't for adenylkinase, once you got from 1, which is 100% ATP, to 0.5, you would have no ATP left. You would only have ADP. But in this case, a significant portion of the ADP has been transformed into AMP and ATP, which means that even though there's, a, there's half of the charge remaining, you still have a th full third concentration of ATP that's still usable. That being said, human cells don't normally get to 0.5. I have some examples here. For example, in skeletal muscle, the adenylate charge at rest is around 99 or 0.99. With intense exercise, it sits in the 0.85 range. Senescent cells such as fibroblasts might sit at 0.55, but human cells don't get much lower than 0.5 under physiological conditions. If you look at the brain, 0.93 is around where usual neurons sit. During a stroke in the penumbra region at two hours, the AEC may be more in the high 70 or 80 range, point, point 0.8, sorry. And then if looking at the ischemic core of a stroke, it's right down to 0.45. In various animal studies, cells that reach 0.3 AEC have limited reversibility. In some cases, the ischemia of being at this level of charge is too destructive for the cell and they do not recover when the situation is reversed. Finally, um, the lowest value I could find was a 0.1 in the, a rat study that looked at brain that had been anoxic for 60 minutes. So this is dead tissue. There is another possible mechanism using the adenylate deaminase enzyme that can pull even more usable ATP out of the equilibrium. If you remove the product, then the reaction will replace the products. So if you remove AMP from the equilibrium, the adenylkinase reaction will replace it with more AMP and ATP. So adenylate deaminase pulls an amine group off of the AMP to leave IMP. This is actually sacrificing your nucleotides in cases where the, uh, just to maintain some usable ATP. Um, obviously it's not a permanent solution and once the energy is restored, the IMP is recycled back to a usable nucleotide through the following reactions. This is known as the purine nucleotide cycle. And if it looks familiar, it is very similar to the urea cycle. It's just an example of how cells tend to use similar uh, principles for different reactions.
One more group of molecules that we need to discuss are redox cofactors. These are coenzymes that are used in redox reactions in the biological setting. They each carry the equivalent of two electrons in their reduced forms. They include flavin adenine dinucleotide, FAD, which is the oxidized form, or FADH2, which is the reduced form. These are derived from vitamin B2 riboflavin and are typically incorporated into proteins known as flavoproteins rather than existing in their soluble form. There's also NAD, nicotine adenine dinucleotide, which exists in oxidized NAD plus and reduced NADH. These are derived from vitamin B3, niacin or nicotinic acid. There's also NAD phosphate, which is similar to NAD, except it has an additional phosphate group. It's mainly used in fatty acid synthesis and detoxifying reactive oxygen species. You may recognize it from the pentose phosphate pathway, which starts with the enzyme glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase and is used to generate NADPH. If you have a look at NAD here, you may think that the nitrogen is part involved in the redox reaction, but using our principles of oxidation numbers from before, you can see that it's actually a change in the oxidation numbers of the carbons through a change in the bonds to the nitrogen. This one goes from plus one to zero, and then minus one to minus two for a total reduction of two. Likewise, with the FAD, there's two plus two species that go to plus one each, a reduction of minus two. Now, NAD and NADH do exist in a soluble form, and it can be used analogously to adenylate charge, although in this case, the oxidized form NAD plus is used as the numerator. Um, this is probably because NAD plus exists in much higher quantities. It also varies between the cytosol and the mitochondria. The cytosol has a lower quantity of both species and also a much, much higher concentration of the, the oxidized form than the reduced form. In the mitochondria, the concentration of the reduced form is much closer to that of the oxidized form with a ratio of 6.3 or when it's particularly reduced, closer to one. In the cytosol, the ratio gets to possibly 82 to one of NAD to NADH. And this is probably in the setting of intense exercise. Before we look at the actual metabolic pathways, we should probably ask, where is this metabolic energy actually coming from? The answer is oxygen, which might be a bit counterintuitive because we tend to think of food as a fuel and a source of energy. In fact, this is probably a popular misconception because nutritional values give us the quantity of energy as coming from a food. If you remember the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation, um, you get the impression that oxygen is just functioning as a terminal electron acceptor. If you actually look at the um, energy quantities involved, while both reduced molecules and oxygen are required, almost all of the free energy is actually coming from the molecular oxygen. This is a diagram of free energy. And you can see, if you look at the bottom of the diagram, all of the fuels marked in black, glucose, ethanol, methane, hydrogen, are very close to the free energy of the products, carbon dioxide and water. The only one that has significant delta energy is oxygen. Without oxygen, there's very little difference between reactants and products and very little free energy available, as you'll see in the coming slides. Reduced molecules function to unlock the potential energy from oxygen, and the energy yield is roughly proportional to the amount of oxygen consumed. 
I thought this was a very interesting revelation. I have actually cited a summer a review article um, that goes into this with a bit more evidence involved, but this is where I got the diagram from as well. Dietary energy contained in food has traditionally been measured by burning it in oxygen, which is where we get these values, but it's not the source of the oxygen. This is a bomb calorimeter, which is used to measure energy in food, and it measures the heat when you burn it, essentially. But that sort of creates the misconception that the energy is coming from the food. Despite the fact that oxygen provides the energy in these reactions, we can still describe food products as fuel. If you think about other fuels such as octane or methane, those are burned in oxygen as well, and the energy comes from the same place, so it's a valid analogy. So what fuels can human cells use? This diagram provides a nice overview. Essentially, you have exogenous uh, molecules such as carbohydrates, um, particularly monosaccharides such as glucose and fructose. You have triglycerides, which are made up of three fatty acids um, bonded to glycerol, which is a backbone, and both of those can be used as fuel. And proteins, which are made of amino acids. Ethanol is uh, an exogenous toxin, which also provides a lot of energy when it's metabolized. Although from an evolutionary point of view, we didn't, we weren't designed to use it as a fuel. Endogenous sources of fuel include metabolic intermediates like lactate and pyruvate and ketone bodies, which have a unique role in starvation. So after all the emphasis on oxygen being the source of energy, I'm going to start with a process that doesn't require oxygen. This is glycolysis, which you might remember. The important thing to remember about glycolysis is that there are three key steps which are irreversible. The first is the hexakinase or glucokinase step, where glucose is trapped in the cell by converting it to glucose 6-phosphate. The second is the rate limiting step of glycolysis, fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Um, this is modulated by an allosteric mechanism by the presence of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which is also derived from fructose 6-phosphate. The presence of this drives forward the forward reaction and inhibits the reverse reaction. Finally, there is PEP, phospholinyl pyruvate, to pyruvate, and the reverse reaction, which happens in two steps via oxaloacetate. And you can see here, there is the irreversible step of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. I'm going to add here the conversion of pyruvate to lactate, which we'll go into in a second. So glycolysis is a process where a six carbon molecule glucose splits into two three carbon molecules and then two one carbon molecules of CO2 are removed, leaving the two two carbons of acetyl-CoA. So glucose yields between 30 and 32 ATP when reacted with oxygen but glycolysis on its own can provide two ATP without the need for oxygen or mitochondria. So again, oxygen is the source of most of the energy, but there is a very small amount of energy in a form of ATP that you can liberate without oxygen. This is useful in the setting such as red blood cells, which don't have mitochondria, or the renal medulla and epidermis, which are functionally anaerobic. The renal medulla has a limited vascular supply due to the countercurrent mechanisms used in renal physiology. Now the pathway from glycogen to pyruvate or lactate is even more efficient because it yields three ATP as you lack the ATP investing step of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. It also derives the glucose molecules from glycogen, which are already present within the cell and doesn't need to liberate glucose from the blood. This means that the process can happen very quickly when needed. Finally, pyruvate is immediately transformed to lactate by LDH. And this is a normal step in glycolysis. Um, 
and if you can see the glyceraldehydes, three phosphates or one six bisphosphoglycerate step, that creates NADH. And if this was allowed to continue without the NADH being transferred into the mitochondria, the um, the NADH would inhibit the reaction because it's a product in the equilibrium, and glycolysis would grind to a halt basically. So what you need is to recycle the NADH, given it's not being used in the mitochondria, um, back to NAD+, which is done by lactate dehydrogenase. The equilibrium constant is about 9,000 for LDH, which means lactate exceeds pyruvate by at least tenfold, which makes it the, the final step of glycolysis, essentially, especially in the anaerobic setting. Um, the pyruvate concentration is always going to be lower than the lactate concentration. Circulating lactate can be used as fuel, for example, by cardiac muscle, which is strictly aerobic, or it can be converted back to glucose by the liver through gluconeogenesis. This is known as the Cori cycle between different tissues. Finally, anything that inhibits oxidative phosphorylation or accelerates glycolysis or muscle glycogenolysis will increase lactate production. Regarding that final step, um, muscle doesn't have the ability to turn uh, to undergo gluconeogenesis and release glucose into the bloodstream in its glucose form because it doesn't have that final glucose 6 phosphatase. Um, that means that anything that drives glycogenolysis in muscle will have to be forced down the glycolysis pathway. We're now going to look at glycolysis in some more detail, including pathways that regulate it. To start with, um, we're going to look at the G protein coupled alpha S pathway. The G protein coupled receptor activates adenylate cyclase, which activates AMP, which activates protein kinase A. This is the pathway that's activated by adrenaline, particularly via the beta adrenergic receptors and glucagon by its own receptor. I'll mention at this point that muscle does not have glucagon receptors, but it does have beta adrenergic receptors. As you can see here, protein kinase A works on multiple steps in glycogenolysis and uh, glycolysis. In particular, it inhibits glycolysis and favors gluconeogenesis, as you can see in this summary table in a second. I'm just going to add here that GI inhibits adenylate cyclase um, for completeness. So on the summary, glycogen is broken down, gluconeogenesis is favored, or if gluconeogenesis can't happen, then glycolysis is inhibited and lipids are broken down from triglycerides, which is not shown here. Next, we'll look at the insulin receptor, which is a catalytic receptor with the insulin receptor substrate unit attached to it, which works via PI3K, uh, PIP3, PDK1, and then AKT, which is also known as protein kinase B. This inhibits cyclic AMP by stimulating phosphodiesterase. AKT works on multiple parts of the pathway again, and notably it also uh, stimulates the translocation of GLUT4 transporter to the cell membrane, which allows glucose influx to the cell. So I'm just going to go over the relevant uh, glute transporters for glucose um, because there are multiple subtypes, but the most important are glute 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, I made a mnemonic called ulna um, after the bone be, uh, to remember these. Glute 1 is ubiquitous and particularly it provides the glucose influx for red blood cells which requires glucose and glycolysis for energy provision. GLUT2 is an interesting one. 
because it is present on liver cells and also islet cells in the pancreas and it has a it has a um, low sensitivity for glucose um, effectively acting as a glucose sensor um, normal blood glucose level is about five and this really starts picking up glucose at higher levels um, probably in the 10 to teen range um, which allows it to um, provide an influx of glucose when there is excessive glucose which is critical to liver glycogen storage and also insulin production and release next one is glute 3 um, which is present in neurons and cns cells um, and it is extremely sensitive for glucose um, allowing the brain to receive glucose at very low levels down to a, around one millimole range and finally GLUT4 is present in adipose tissue and muscle and is the one regulated by insulin other GLUT um, transporters such as uh, GLUT5 is one present in the intestine and transports fructose but there's quite a few in the intestine, um, which I won't go into. And if we have a look at the summary table, we've added GLUT4 glucose uptake. Um, insulin, as you can see on the diagram, favors glycogen synthesis, which is the opposite, and glycolysis. So, which also makes sense. If you think of uh, the response to hypoglycemia, insulin and glucagon um, form the opposite reactions insulin serves to lower the blood glucose level by driving it into the cell and metabolizing it um, and into glycogen as well whereas glucagon works to um, liberate glucose and release it into the bloodstream to uh, in a response to hypoglycemia in a more general sense, glucose is the um, signaling uh, molecule that there is ample nutrients and that the body should um, proceed with fatty acid synthesis and esterification, as well as protein synthesis. The next pathway I'm going to mention is the natriuretic peptide pathway, briefly. Um, which works via the NPR um, receptor um, to activate GMP, which can also be activated by guanylate cyclase. Um, and this leads to protein kinase G. In a metabolic sense, um, this is very similar to the um, GS pathway um, and works in a very similar fashion and is most relevant to lipolysis. Um, because fat cells have um, natriuretic peptide receptors. In a more um, general sense, the G, uh, PKG pathway serves to inhibit the GQ pathway, which is calcium mediated, as you can see here. Um, now, calcium is an interesting one because it can both be activated by a GQ receptor via uh, PLC beta and IP3, or it can be activated directly by an influx of calcium, um, which means that muscle contraction and cell depolarization can both trigger this pathway, not just receptor binding. Um, so if you can see on here, um, a major action for calcium in this setting is the liberation of um, glucose 6-phosphate from gluc glycogen um, which is relevant in the setting of muscle contraction. It also works um, to stimulate glycolysis. Now you might be wondering how any of these work particularly to sense the level of energy in a cell most of them are reacting to external sources. The one that is probably most relevant is calcium, which um, because in muscle cells that is anticipating an energy deficit, but it's not sensing one. So there is a 
there is a pathway that you probably don't hear too much about in medical school and it responds to this equilibrium that we can see between ATP, ADP and the action of adenyl kinase to form AMP and ATP from ADP. And this, this pathway senses a low adenylate energy charge, as you can see here, and that is the AMPK pathway. Um, that stands for AMP, adenyl, uh, sorry, adenosine monophosphate stimulated kinase. So the AMP pathway is the cell's response in the short term to an energy deficit. It senses particularly the presence of AMP, which is made to try and free up ATP from ADP um, and is also inhibited by ATP. So in particular, it senses a, an elevated ratio of AMP to ATP. So if you can see on the diagram, and also in the summary table, the actions of AMPK are very interesting. They work to free up glycogen um, to be used as glucose, and they also drive forward the glycolysis pathway. Finally, they also work to um, translocate GLUT4 to the cell membrane to allow glucose into the cell in the same way that insulin does. But unlike insulin, its other actions are the opposite of insulin because it is the signal that energy and um, fuel supply is low, whereas insulin stim um, signals that energy is high. As a result, AMPK inhibits protein synthesis and fatty acid synthesis. Um, now, interestingly, there is a, a drug that's probably relevant um, in most acute medicine that works via the AMPK pathway, and that drug is metformin. And as you might know, metformin, um, one of the feared um, tox uh, toxicities of metformin is a lactic acidosis. And that is from excess metformin driving glycolysis, um, where the glucose is converted to pyruvate and then lactate. We're now going to move from the cytosol to the mitochondria. Um, a mitochondrion is an essential organelle in eukaryotic cells, where the prim primary function is um, met metabolic and um, oxidative metabolism in particular. Um, looking at the structure of mitochondrion, it has an outer membrane, which is relatively permeable to molecules, as well as an inner membrane, which is extremely impermeable. Essentially, um, most molecules will need some form of port or transporter to uh, leave or enter the mitochondrial matrix, which is inside the membrane. Mitochondria also have these invaginations um, known as Christi, which um, provide additional surface area for these reactions to take place. So from glycolysis, um, glycolysis produces pyruvate, which is transported into the mitochondrial matrix, where it's then converted into acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA enters the citric acid cycle. Um, Essentially, you have a four carbon molecule oxaloacetate, which combines with the two carbon acetyl group, becoming citrate. This proceeds around the cycle, liberating CO2 and providing reduced species NADH and FADH2, um, which converts it back to a four carbon molecule and the oxaloacetate can be reused. These reduced species via the electron transport chain um, drive hydrogen across the um, inner membrane to the intermembrane space, providing a, creating a proton gradient. And then the protein gradient, proton gradient drives ATP synthase, converting ADP back to ATP. Um, 
the ATP and ADP cross the membrane via the ANT transporter. And this can be converted to phosphocreatine from creatine via mitochondrial creatine kinase, which is attached to the inner, the outside of the inner membrane. This creates the bank of ATP and phosphocreatine that can be used in cytosol for energy intensive processes such as muscle contraction and ion channels or ion pumps. Um, notice that NADH and NAD plus cannot move readily via the um, mitochondrial inner membrane and it also needs transporters. In fact, these molecules do not cross the membrane at all. In fact, it has to occur via a shuttle. So that's a reaction that's reversible on either side of the uh, mitochondrial membrane where the intermediates are able to cross via dedicated channels such as aspartate and malate. There's also a similar, um, a similar pathway that occurs using glycerol 3-phosphate. This shuttle, the malate aspartate shuttle, is part, um, takes place um, as part of the urea cycle where an essential step, the creation of carbon oil phosphate and ornithine conversion to citrulline take place within the mitochondria and then the citrulline leaves and the rest of the cycle takes place in the cytosol. Um, the aspartate and fumarate are recycled via this um, aspartate malate shuttle. Beta oxidation, which is the process of fatty acid oxidation for to create acetyl-CoA and reduce molecules, also takes place in the mitochondrial matrix and uses an a special uh, a special um, mechanism to for fatty acyl CoA to enter the mitochondrial ma matrix, which is the carnitine shuttle, which we'll go into in more depth in a minute. The process of ketogenesis from excess acetyl CoA also takes place in the mitochondrial matrix, and it only takes place in hepatocytes. Um, the process of ethanol metabolism takes place partially in the cytosol and then the rest of it takes place again in the mitochondria. And then finally, um, there are multiple types of um, amino acid metabolism that take place in the mitochondrial matrix. We're now going to take a closer look at the citric acid cycle, which is also known as the tricarboxylic acid cycle, TCA cycle, or the Krebs cycle. We start with pyruvate from glycolysis, which is transported into the mitochondria from the cytosol. Pyruvate is a three carbon molecule, which is denoted in red. Pyruvate is transformed into acetyl-CoA, a two carbon acetyl group with coenzyme A, with one carbon released to CO2. The enzyme is pyruvate dehydrogenase, a massive protein complex which contains its own regulatory kinase and phosphatase. Next, the two carbons from acetyl-CoA are combined with the four carbon oxaloacetate to form the six carbon citrate molecule. CoA is recycled. Citrate is converted reversibly to isocitrate and then isocitrate is oxidized to form alpha ketoglutarate with the release of a CO2 molecule. Isocitrate dehydrogenase is the rate determining step of the citric acid cycle. We then have the second irreversible oxidation with the release of another CO2 and formation of succinyl CoA. Succinyl CoA is then converted to succinate with the formation of 1 ATP and then succinate is oxidized to fumarate by succinate dehydrogenase, which is a flavor protein. Finally, fumarate is converted to malate and malate is reversibly oxidized to oxaloacetate to restart the cycle. Pyruvate can be converted directly to oxaloacetate with the addition of a carbon as the first step of gluconeogenesis or simply to replenish the intermediates in the cycle this process is known as anaplerosis. 
for gluconeogenesis, oxaloacetate is, needs to be converted back to three carbons with the release of CO2. CO2 is interesting from an equilibrium point of view because it diffuses away and removes products pulling the reaction in the forward direction. Likewise, if NADH or FADH are produced but not recycled, their accumulation will work to inhibit the citric acid cycle and pyruvate dehydrogenase. This will become relevant for ketogenesis later. In the reverse direction, the equilibrium helps drive metabolism when reduced species are low. We should now look back at what is happening from an oxidation number point of view. The carbons in acetyl-CoA have oxidation numbers of plus three and minus three with an average of zero. I'll add the oxidation numbers for the rest of the cycle in blue, and you can see that the average for the carbon molecules in the intermediates stay pretty close to plus one. While this is consistent, it doesn't really explain where the reaction is happening. The important thing to look at is the CO2. The average numbers don't include the carbon in CO2, which has an oxidation number of plus four. If we do include them, we'll see that the cycle goes from six carbons with an average oxidation number of plus one to six carbons with an average oxidation number of plus two and one thirds, a significant increase. The CO2 then diffuses away and the cycle can continue. We're now going to go to the next step, which is the electron transport chain, which is composed of four complexes and two cofactors located at the inner mitochondrial membrane. The point of these reactions is to convert the redox reactions that start with a reduction of cofactors, recycle the cofactors back to their oxidized forms and use the energy from oxygen to generate a pro proton gradient. Complex one takes the two electrons from NADH and recycles it back to NAD+. In the process, it transports four protons across the membrane. Succinate dehydrogenase is part of complex two, which does the same with FADH2, except it does not span the membrane, so no protons are transported in this step. Both complexes funnel their hydrogen, their electrons into complex Q. Complex Q transports an electron pair at a time across complex three to cytochrome C, in the process transporting another four protons. Cytochrome C then transports them to complex four, which pumps a final two protons before donating their electrons to form to oxygen to form water. Now you might be asking at this point, if the energy is coming from oxygen, why does it only come in at the end? Don't think about it like that. This is a long chain of interlinked redox reactions taking place simultaneously. They could not take place without oxygen. We're now up to the final step, which is ATP synthesis. The electrochemical gradient created by the protons is used like a hydroelectric dam to drive a literal mechanical turbine, which converts ADP into ATP. This takes place with a ratio of approximately four hydrogen to one ATP. The reason I'm looking at this in so much detail is we can now work out how many ATP are generated for one redox carrier. NADH leads to the transport of a total of 10 protons, which yields a total of 2.5 ATP for each NADH. Because FADH misses complex one, it only transports six hydrogen or protons, yielding 1.5 ATP per FADH. This gets interesting because while the number of ATP depends on which redox carrier is used, the amount of oxygen only depends on the amount of carriers and therefore electrons. Let's look at the total energy yield for glucose. Glycolysis gives a total of two ATP, but also two NADH, which yield either 2.5 or 1.5 ATP depending on which shuttle is used to enter the mitochondria, but the same number of electrons and no CO2. Pyruvate dehydrogenase gives two NADH and two CO2 because it's run twice. TCA cycle, again times two, gives us six NADH 
two FADH and two GTP, which give a total of 20 ATP with 16 electrons and four CO2. We, uh, this overall gives a total of 30 to 32 ATP, depending on which, which shuttle is used, and 24 electrons and six CO2. We can now work out how much oxygen is used from the total of 24 electrons. One mole of glucose needs six moles of O2. Because it also yields six moles of CO2, we can calculate the respiratory quotient is one. You might recognize this from the alveolar gas equation. Finally, we can also calculate that glucose metabolism yields between five and five and one third ATP for each mole of oxygen consumed, which will become relevant in a minute. We can now compare the yields of glucose metabolism with the yields of fatty acid metabolism, which is the other major catabolic process in mitochondria. We'll start with the fatty acid palmitate, which has a 14 carbon hydrocarbon chain attached to a carboxylic acid. Fatty acid molecules are actually relatively dangerous in a biological setting because they act like detergents and can disrupt cell membranes, so they're usually stored as triglycerides. Like how glucose becomes glucose 6-phosphate, fatty acids need to be converted to fatty acyl-CoA to trap and direct them within the cell. Beta oxidation takes place in the mitochondria, and the primary way cells regulate fat metabolism is by restricting fatty acid entrance into the mitochondria. As mentioned before, fatty acyl-CoA needs help getting across the mitochondrial membrane, and this is done via the carnitine shuttle system. Once in the mitochondrial matrix, beta oxidation strips away two carbons from the acyl-CoA molecule at a time, with each cycle producing an acetyl-CoA, an NADH, and an FADH2. As it proceeds, the ratio of NAD plus to NADH decreases until the reduced form can be recycled in the electron transport chain. As FAD or FADH2 are incorporated into proteins, beta oxidation has its own version of complex 2 with a relevant flavor protein. Finally, the acetyl-CoA is consumed by the citric acid cycle, and when all of the um, beta oxidation cycles are complete, it leaves one final acetyl-CoA. If too much fatty acid oxidation is taking place for the cell's energy requirements, the NAD plus NADH ratio will inhibit the citric acid cycle and citrate will accumulate with some returning to the cytosol and forming acetyl-CoA through ATP citrate lyase. This tells the cell that it has enough acetyl-CoA and in a hepatocyte could initiate fatty acid synthesis. The rate limiting enzyme for fatty acid synthesis is acetyl-CoA carboxylase, which forms malonyl-CoA from acetyl-CoA. Malonyl-CoA is a potent allosteric inhibitor of the carnitine shuttle and stops fatty acyl-CoA entering the mitochondria. The strongest signaling pathway up regulating acetyl-CoA carboxylase is insulin because it signals a well-fed state and the strongest inhibitory signal is AMP kinase. While fatty acid synthesis only takes place in limited locations, such as hepatocytes and adipose cells, this malonyl-CoA mechanism is present even in cells like muscle, where it exists purely as a signal to switch between fatty acid and carbohydrate metabolism. Now let's look at some yields for fatty acid metabolism, specifically one palmitate molecule. Activation requires a couple of ATP, and we don't have the CO2 generating pyruvate dehydrogenase step. Instead, we have beta oxidation, which generates seven NADH, seven FADH2, and seven plus one acetyl-CoA in the final step. We then have the yields from eight rounds of acetyl-CoA going through the citric acid cycle, which includes the generation of 16 CO2. In total, 
we have 106 moles of ATP for one mole of palmitate. As with glucose, we can work out the oxygen requirement from the number of electron carriers, which gives 23 moles of O2. This means that the respiratory quotient for palmitate is 0.7, which is 16 divided by 23, which means that fat produces significantly less CO2 per oxygen consumed. Finally, we can work out the ACP yield per oxygen which is 106 divided by 23, giving 4.6. Again, ATP is roughly proportional to oxygen consumed, but as you can see, fatty acid metabolism is less efficient at generating energy from oxygen than glucose metabolism, which gives at least 5 ATP. This is what I think is most interesting for critical care because it underlies a unique therapy for cardiogenic shock. When someone overdoses on a beta blocker, or worse still, a calcium channel blocker, it produces a life-threatening and difficult to treat picture of severe bradycardia and hypotension. The antidote to this is high-dose insulin therapy, sometimes called high-dose insulin euglycemia therapy, where we give huge doses of short-acting insulin, starting at one unit per kilo per hour. As mentioned before, the heart is strictly aerobic and can use glucose, lactate or fatty acids as fuel. When the heart is failing, it prefers the substrate that gives the most ATP yield per mole of oxygen, which is glucose. Insulin shuts, out, shuts off beta oxidation by forming melanol-CoA and inhibiting the carnitine shuttle. It forces the cell to use glucose, which it drives into the cell. It can also um, affect the redox balance favoring lactate conversion to pyruvate by a similar mechanism. This metabolic switch means that insulin functions as an effective inotrope and chronotrope, causing the heart to beat stronger and faster. We've been through glycolysis, the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation, and even the creatine system for buffering ACP. But how does the cell know which one to use when? The answer is that it uses all of them at once. This is a hydraulic analogy for the different forms of stored, stored energy in the mitochondria and cytosol. Each component is a reservoir with a certain capacity, and they are connected by a conductance or resistance pathway, which limits the rate at which they can equilibrate. At the start of the mo model, we will depict a muscle at rest with a high cytosolic adenylate charge stored in both ATP and phosphocreatine, hence the larger capacity, with a smaller reservoir intracellularly, then upstream the protein grad proton gradient and redox species ready to combine with oxygen and replace the proton gradient. At rest, they are all close to capacity and back up, preventing flow in the same way that we see NADH inhibiting the citric acid cycle. Once exercise starts consuming ATP, all of the channels start flowing and try to replace it, but it can't happen instantly, so it forms a new, partially depleted steady state. At this point, heavier exercise is not possible. Once the exercise stops, the cell needs time to replenish the stored energy carriers. If you wanted to expand the model, you could add anaerobic glycolysis further upstream as a rapid source of ATP, but it would start to ruin the simplicity. You can see how inhibition at various points could cause the final ATP store to run out faster or recover slower. Most steps in this process have chemicals that inhibit them, which are usually dangerous toxins. For example, the pesticide fluoroacetate, known as 1080, inhibits the citric acid cycle. Notably, hypoxia inhibits the electron transport chain because it is providing the energy for the final, via the final reaction. Cyanide also inhibits the complex 4, causing a cellular form of hypoxia. ATP synthase can be bypassed by uncoupling proteins that allow protons to flow back into the matrix, generating heat but no ATP. This is found physiologically in brown fat. 
dinitrophenol is a toxin that functions as an uncoupling agent and has been used as a weight loss aid, again for converting energy directly to heat. At high doses, it is horrifically toxic, manifesting with severe hyperthermia combined with a similar picture to cyanide poisoning. There are even toxins that block the adenine nucleoside translocator, such as carboxyattractyl oside. In 2007, there was an outbreak of poisoning in Bangladesh after people consumed the seedlings from a non-cultivated plant known as Gagrashak, which contains the toxin. There had been recent destructive floods, and as a result, the cost of their staple food, rice, financially, became unaffordable. Around 76 people became sick with vomiting, altered mental state, and liver injury. 19 people died. Like with the cell, it wasn't a problem of energy scarcity, but distribution. I'm going to briefly overview the uh, metabolism of ethanol as an energy fuel source. Um, ethanol is treated as an endogenous toxin by the body um, and metabolized preferentially over other substrates. This, from an evolutionary point of view, this is um, derived from small amounts of ethanol present in, for example, fermented fruit, um, which need to be detoxified. It can happen via three ways um, shown here but primarily through the central pathway with conversion to acetaldehyde and acetate. This process generates large quantities of reduced NADH and acetyl-CoA. Reduced NAD plus NADH ratio drives pyruvate towards lactate and acetoacetate towards malate, inhibiting gluconeogenesis and potentially causing hypoglycemia. Ethanol also stimulates ketogenesis, particularly in relatively fasting states, through acetyl-CoA production and inhibition of the TCA cycle. This will be discussed further in the next slides. Now we're going to talk about ketone bodies. Ketone bodies are generated in hepatic mitochondria from excess acetyl-CoA. I'll emphasize here that they are only formed in the liver. Their function is to provide an alternative fuel to glucose for tissues such as the central nervous system during starvation, as the CNS can't use alternative fuels, notably fatty acids. During starvation, up to 60% of the brain's energy requirement can be provided by ketone bodies, allowing glucose stores to last longer without resorting to protein breakdown for gluconeogenesis. The main factor promoting ketogenesis is decreased insulin to glucagon ratio. This causes lipolysis in adipose tissue. Um, as you might remember, uh, lipolysis is stimulated by the GS uh, pathway and inhibited by insulin via the phosphodiesterase. This leads to increased fatty acid, free fatty acid delivery to hepatocytes acetyl-CoA transport into the mitochondria and oxaloacetate depletion from gluconeogenesis. Exercise is a potent stimulus for ketone production due to the associated hormone signals. When there is increased acetyl-CoA present in the mitochondria relative to oxaloacetate and particularly with a large amount of reduced NADH inhibiting the cycle, acetyl-CoA is diverted into ketone production. Two acetyl-CoA form acetyl-acetyl-CoA, which forms HMG-CoA, and then acetoacetate, the first keto acid. Some of this spontaneously converts to small quantities of acetone, which is a volatile ketone, but not an acid, and most of it is expelled through the lungs. The rest can remain as acetoacetate or be converted further into beta-hydroxybutyrate. The ratio of beta-hydroxybutyrate to acetoacetate depends on the redox state, again through an equilibrium reaction, given that NADH and NAD plus are reactants and products. This can be relevant in situations such as alcoholic ketoacidosis when the NAD plus to NADH ratio is significantly altered. Beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate are released into the circulation and then converted back to acetyl-CoA 
plus or minus additional NADH in non-hepatic tissues such as muscle or brain for use as fuel. Effectively, they are a portable version of acetyl-CoA. Ketoacidosis is a pathological state that can happen in absolute, for example, type 1 diabetes, or relative insulin deficiency. SGLT2 inhibitors, such as empagliflozin, are a relatively new class of anti-diabetic agents that lower glucose by letting it spill into the urine. While very effective at reducing uh, blood glucose level, they markedly increase the risk of DKA because they lower blood glucose, creating a starvation-like state without the accompanying insulin signal. Any stressor that increases catecholamines, such as in illness or surgery, could trigger ketoacidosis, often with a relatively normal blood glucose level. We're now going to talk about our final macronutrient or fuel type, protein and amino acids. There are no proteins that exist only for fuel storage, though albumin and some muscle proteins have high turnover and could essentially function as this. There is also no dedicated pathway for amino acid catabolism, although there is for disposal of the amino groups, which we'll go into later. During starvation, some amino acids are funneled into either pyruvate or intermediates of the citric acid cycle, which means that they can be converted into oxaloacetate and used in gluconeogenesis. These are known as glucogenic amino acids. Two amino acids cannot participate at all in gluconeogenesis, instead joining the acetyl-CoA ketogenesis pathway and are known as ketogenic. Several amino acids are broken into both glucogenic and ketogenic components. From a nutritional point of view, amino acids can be considered essential, which means that we cannot synthesize them and we need an external source, conditionally essential, meaning they can be functionally essential under certain physiological or pathological states, or non-essential, meaning that the body can produce them if needed. You are expected to be able to list the nine essential amino acids for the primary exam. I'm going to go through how I conceptualize them. There are only two purely ketogenic amino acids. Both of them are essential, essential and both of them start with the letter L, lysine and leucine. That bit's pretty easy. Leucine is the first group, the first of a group of three branch chain amino acids, all of which are essential. There is one branch chain amino acid in each metabolic category. We have isoleucine, which is both glucogenic and ketogenic, and finally valine, which is purely glucogenic. So that's four out of nine essential amino acids covered, which is not bad. The other two glucogenic essential amino acids are histidine and methionine. And the other three are both glucogenic and ketogenic. Those are phenylalanine, tryptophan, and threonine. I like to remember this structure with the branch chain amino acids at the core. If you remember lysine plus the three branch chain amino acids, then the other five essential amino acids are all of the amino acids that contain the letter H in the name. So that's our essential amino acids done. There's only one other amino acid in the both glucogenic and ketogenic category, which is conditionally it's essential, and that's tyrosine. All of the other amino acids are purely glucogenic. I'm going to just throw them up on the screen. There's five conditionally essential and five more non-essential. And this gives the 20 traditional proteinogenic amino acids for humans. I didn't dwell on the individual less essential ones yet because I don't think that's an easy way to learn them without looking at more factors. You might see people put them in various categories based on polarity or charge or size. But I think the most sensible and unambiguous way to categorize them is based on what chemical groups and structures are present in their side chains, which are shown in yellow. 
there'll be some overlap. So this is going to turn into another slightly elaborate Venn diagram. To start with, we have the simplest comp components, pure hydrocarbons, that is only carbon and hydrogen side chains. These can be divided into aliphatic, which includes the branched chain amino acids and the non-branched alanine, glycine and proline. And the single aromatic pure hydrocarbon side chain, which belongs to phenylalanine. Prote proline, sorry, also has a ring structure, but does not share bonds within the ring structure like benzene does or phenylalanine. Our next group are amino acids that contain oxygen in their side chains. These can be further divided into those with a hydroxyl group, tyrosine, serine, and threonine, the two with a carboxylic acid group, aspartate or aspartic acid, and glutamate or glutamic acid, and finally those with an amide group, where the oxygen has been substituted for a nitrogen group. Asparagine and glutamine are clearly analogous to aspartate and glutamate respectively. This overlaps with our next group, the nitrogen containing side chains. This also includes three, three essential amino acids, lysine, histidine and tryptophan, as well as arginine, which uniquely contains three nitrogen groups in its side chain alone. After that, we have the sulfur containing amino acids, cysteine and methionine. We can add yet another overlapping category to unite the aromatic side chains of histidine, tryptophan, phenylalanine and tyrosine, which span multiple element groups. Phenylalanine was unique before because it's the only aromatic um, side chain that doesn't contain another element like nitrogen or oxygen. All of the aromatic essential uh, amino acids are essential, except for tyrosine, which is conditionally essential. We can now look at some chemical properties. Because ammonia groups like to act like bases, arginine and lysine have plus one charge in the physiological setting, and histidine has plus one charge about 10% of the time. The carboxylic acids have minus one charge and exist in vivo as the anions aspartate and glutamate. You can remember glutamate has minus one because of its famous salt monosodium glutamate or because the suffix is similar to pyruvate and lactate, which are also the anions of organic acids. In terms of polarity, methionine, tryptophan, and all of the hydrocarbon only amino acids are considered nonpolar, while cysteine, the charged nitrogenous and all oxygen containing side chains are considered polar. Tryptophan is the least polar amino acid to the extent that it has very limited water solubility and needs to be transported in the blood bound to albumin. For completeness, I'm going to mention briefly the 21st proteinogenic amino acid, which is selenocysteine, which contains selenium instead of sulfur and exists in select proteins known as selenoproteins. It's coded for by a specialized stop codon. It does not exist as a pool in the cell as it is too reactive, and it is not an essential amino acid, though selenium is an essential micronutrient. I won't discuss its metabolism further, though it would be considered glucogenic. Amino acids are special because they can typically exchange their amino groups with each other in reversible transamination reactions, leaving a deaminated form known as an alpha keto acid, not to be confused with ketone bodies. Three of them have deaminated forms which are familiar molecules. Glutamate becomes alpha ketoglutarate from the TCA cycle. Aspartate becomes oxaloacetate, again from the TCA cycle. And alanine becomes pyruvate. We'll look at the applications of this in the next slide. Let's look at a typical amino acid with side chain R. It can undergo transamination with the aid of a transaminase enzyme and an essential cofactor pyridoxal phosphate derived from vitamin B6. The amino group is replaced by a ketone group 
with the nitrogen passed on to another keto acid to form its respective amino acid. Typically, the recipient keto acid will be alpha ketoglutarate, forming glutamate, although sometimes it will be pyruvate, forming alanine. These reactions are readily reversible, such that the amino groups are shared evenly between all participating amino acid keto acids present, but most notably with glutamate. Ammonia is highly toxic, so if the amino acids are going to be metabolized, the body needs a centralized route to dispose of it. The central route involves the enzyme glutamate dehydrogenase, which removes the amino group without passing it to another keto acid and converts glutamate back to alpha ketoglutarate, ready to accept more ammonia. As we know from equilibria, if you remove the product of reversible reaction, it will drive it forward. So this funnels amino groups from various amino acids onto glutamate, which can then be stripped off for disposal. Without their amino groups, the keto acids merge with our core metabolic pathways where they can be oxidized for energy or converted either into glucose or ketone bodies in the liver. One example is alanine which is deaminated to pyruvate by the enzyme alanine aminotransferase, or ALT. A special example are our branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine, because branch chain aminotransferase is unusually present in the muscle and not the liver. This means that these are spared by hepatic metabolism, but can be deaminated in muscle and undergo oxidation as fuel. You might wonder if these reactions are reversible, why are these amino acids nutritionally essential? While the transamination is reversible, a laser dehydrogenase step is not. In fact, um, the keto acids uh, for the respective amino acids would function as a um, would function as an essential nutrient in their place as long as you are consuming enough nitrogen. So what happens to the free ammonia? Well, firstly, it can be combined with existing glutamate to form glutamine, which functions as a reservoir to safely store additional nitrogen without it being present as toxic ammonia. Ammonia itself is disposed of in the urea cycle, which you might be familiar with, and I'll outline here. Ammonia combines with bicarbonate in, a, in the mitochondrial matrix with enzyme CPS1 to form carbamoyl phosphate. This combines with the non-proteinogenic amino acid ornithine to form citrulline, another amino acid. Citrulline then moves to the cytosol and combines with aspartate to form arginosuccinate. Arginosuccinate is split into arginine, adding the amino group from aspartate and leaving the carbon skeleton in the form of fumarate. Arginine now has two nitrogen groups bound to removable carbon on the end of its side chain. This is split off as urea, removing two nitrogen and leaving the third as the terminal group of or ornithine side chain. Ornithine returns to the mitochondrial uh, matrix for the cycle to resume. Adjacent to the urea cycle, we have the malate aspartate shuttle, which we've mentioned before, that recycles fumarate back into aspartate via aspartate aminotransferase. We also have an essential allosteric modulator that regulates CPS1 activity. This is N-acetylglutamate or NAG, which is formed from glutamate and acetyl-CoA by the enzyme NAG synth synthase. NAGS is inhibited by its product as negative feedback, but stimulated by arginine as a feed-forward mechanism to regulate the urea cycle. I understand this is complicated, but there's one more important concept which is that not all of these enzymes are present in the same tissue at once. For example, glutamine synthetase is present in muscle, but not its reverse enzyme, glutaminase. Muscle can't perform the urea cycle, so it needs to export the nitrogen somewhere that can, and glutamine carries two amine groups instead of one. This, combined with muscle's exclusive metabolism of branch chain amino acids and the liver's ability to perform gluconeogenesis, creates interesting metabolic cycles between tissues, such as the glucose alanine cycle, which is analogous to the Cori cycle for lactate. Likewise, only the liver can form, perform all five steps of the urea cycle, although the intestine 
can perform four of them to some extent, and the kidney can convert citrulline to arginine, which creates further cycles. Non-urea cycle tissues can also convert the arginine directly to citrulline to create nitric oxide. The kidney can excrete some free ammonia directly into the urine as well for disposal. Now we've dealt with the nitrogen, we can look at the final question of what happens to the carbon skeletons. I've outlined our previous common metabolic pathways, though they are divided into glucogenic, which is blue, and ketogenic, which is pink, sections. This fundamental distinction is the reason that the body cannot turn fat into glucose. When acetyl-CoA enters the citric acid cycle, both of its carbons are burned off as carbon dioxide. The rest of the carbon was already present as oxaloacetate to combine with acetyl-CoA. If an amino acid skeleton joins as any of the four to six carbon intermediates, or even as the three carbon pyruvate, it can be converted to oxaloacetate to undergo gluconeogenesis, but as two carbon acetyl-CoA, the only options are to be oxidized completely to carbon dioxide or turned into keto ketone bodies, such as acetoacetate. We're now going to run through the individual amino acids just to outline where they join these pathways and what makes them glucogenic or ketogenic. The full pathways can be complex involving cycles of cofactors or long chains of reactions, so this will just be an abbreviated schematic. We'll start with the ones we know already. Glutamate becomes alpha-ketoglutarate, aspartate becomes oxaloacetate. Although virox arginosuccinate in the urea cycle, aspartate can also become fumarate. And then alanine becomes pyruvate. All of these are transamination reactions. We also know that glutamine can be converted to and from glutamate. And in a similar fashion, asparagine can be converted to and from aspartate. We also know that arginine is metabolized to ornithine in the urea cycle, but ornithine itself can be metabolized to glutamate via an intermediate, and proline can be metabolized to glutamate via the same intermediate. Histidine is metabolized to glutamate via a different route. Cysteine and serine are both metabolized to pyruvate, and then glycine can be converted to serine although it can also be metabolized directly to ammonia and CO2, as it is the simplest amino acid. Methionine metabolism is complex and interlinked with folate metabolism. Ultimately, it forms homocysteine and is metabolized via propanol-CoA to succinyl-CoA, again making it glucogenic. Valine also joins this pathway after a series of steps that are similar for all three branch chain amino acids. Isoleucine joins a bit further back at propanol-CoA, but it gives off an acetyl-CoA in the process, which makes it both glucogenic and ketogenic. Despite the similar metabolic pathway, leucine is ultimately metabolized into acetyl-CoA and acetoacetate, making it one of the two purely ketogenic amino acids. The other is lysine, which is metabolized to acetyl-acetyl-CoA via ke ketoadipate. Tryptophan is metabolized via, via this same intermediate, but it gives off an alanine, alanine molecule in the process, making it both ketogenic and glucogenic. Threonine gives off a glycine and then is converted to acetyl acetaldehyde, which joins the ketogenic pathway, as we know from alcohol metabolism. This makes it both glucogenic and ketogenic. Tyrosine is metabolized to fumarate and acetoacetate. And then finally, phenylalanine is metabolized directly to tyrosine, which makes both of them glucogenic and ketogenic. Amino acids can also, in the case of non-essential amino acids, be synthesized by the body, sometimes via the same pathways and sometimes via different pathways. They can also be converted into specialized products such as neurotransmitters like histamine or the other 
catecholamines, but this is beyond the scope of this presentation. That was the last of the core metabolic content, but I'd like to touch on a couple of extra topics that relate to cellular methods of energy regulation. To start with, I'm going to revisit two of our redox carriers, NAD plus and NADP plus. Like the adenosine phosphate based energy carriers, these redox carriers have a complex cycle of synthesis and degradation. Apart from the usual pathway via vitamin B3, they can also be synthesized from the amino acid tryptophan via one of the specialized path pathways mentioned last slide. They also have an analog to AMP sensitive kinase, which is sirtuin 1. This senses when NAD plus to NADH ratio is elevated as a sign of possible energy depletion. Logically, one result of CERT activation is stimulation of the AMPK pathway, stimulating all of the responses to help conserve energy and provide more fuel for oxidation. AMPK has another related signaling molecule known as hypoxia inducible factor or HIF. While AMPK responds to the immediate depletion of energy in the form of ATP, HIF detects the lack of oxygen itself and mediates longer term responses to hypoxia, hypoperfusion, exercise and anemia. HIF is a peptide that is continually synthesized, but in the pres presence of oxygen it is hydroxylated and tagged with the von hippel lindau protein and ubiquitin for destruction in proteasomes. In the absence of oxygen, it persists and functions as a transcription factor for multiple genes. These include most enzymes involved in glycolysis, GLUT1 and GLUT3 for more basal glucose influx, as well as vascular endothelial growth factor to help stimulate local angiogenesis. It also stimulates production of erythropoiesin to stimulate red blood cell production, as well as iron regulatory factors to produce heme. So energy metabolism is a massive topic and there is a lot of content that I haven't covered. Um, a lot of it relates to intracellular receptors and pathways and transcription factors. So if you're particularly interested in this topic, here's what I'd suggest you look into further. Sterol regulatory element binding proteins and the related carbohydrate regulator, regulatory element binding proteins, PPAR receptors and fork head box protein FOXO1. These are all related to carbohydrate and lipid metabolism and insulin signaling. Um, and with regard to some of the PPARs, the fibrates and the glitazone drugs will work by this pathway. In addition, glucocorticoid and thyroid hormone receptors are also relevant to energy metabolism. In particular, glucocorticoid receptors stimulate longer term um, upregulation of gluconeogenesis, which is how they cause hyperglycemia. And thyroid hormone receptors uh, particularly stimulate thermogenesis via uncoupling proteins. There is also a, a pathway involved in uh, stimulus of protein synthesis, autophagy, and other signals related to apoptosis, uh, known as mTOR. This is part of um, the insulin signaling pathway, and it was not featured in um, this presentation for reasons of simplicity. Um, related medical topics, if you're interested, inborn errors of metabolism is a massive topic. Most of these outside of the very core enzymes in the TCA cycle and glycolysis have some form of inborn error of metabolism, particularly the amino acids and the urea cycle, which are very interesting topics. Liver failure, most of a lot of this um, biochemistry takes place in the liver and in liver failure, you can have all, all sorts of um, abnormalities with this. And finally, obesity and insulin resistance are also a major topic um, because it involves all of these same mechanisms. Now, I thought I'd share some of the books and web resources I used. 
I have no financial conflicts or ties to any of these, I just found them useful. Anyone studying for the CICM primary will know about derangephysiology.com. It's a great resource and probably contains all the metabolism you actually need to know for the exam. You could easily learn a few semesters worth of biochemistry just with YouTube. I found that you can search for basically any pathway and as long as it's not something related to fitness pseudoscience that will swamp your uh, search results, you'll probably find what you want. In particular, I, I found the channel AK Lectures um, is fantastic. He goes into a lot of detail and a lot of depth without any unnecessary information. I found some of the others were a little bit too superficial and sort of just gave a, a basic textbook answer. Uh, but he really goes into detail on the um, enzyme actions and things like that. So it's, it's definitely worth looking. And there's a lot of topics. You can also look at review articles in um, scientific literature. Um, if you go to Google Scholar, you'll often find a PDF link. If you search for something like uh, HIF or AMPK, look for a recent review article in the last 10 years or so, and it can give you a great summary of the topic and some, um, some good sort of summary diagrams and things like that. Um, finally, I really love books, um, in particular ones with good diagrams. Um, so if I could recommend only one book, it would be uh, Human Metabolism, a Regulatory Perspective. Um, I find that it's just an amazing book. I practically read it cover to cover, gives an excellent conceptual understanding without going into too much detail, and it had great diagrams. I featured some of them in the presentation, for example, these ones. It's also, it's also a small book. It's less than 400 pages and just over A5 size, so you can sort of carry it around. And finally, it's cheap. It's under 100 Australian dollars, which is good going for a textbook. Um, and otherwise, um, you can use other biochemistry books. I found Harper's Illustrated Biochemistry was very good. Um, I featured, um, I, I used it as a reference, essentially. It features a lot of really good diagrams in terms of uh, chemical reactions and flowcharts. For example, the amino acid metabolism was very good. Um, I, do also, I did also reference Le uh, Leninger's Principles of Biochemistry and Mark's Medical Biochemistry, which are both very similar books and they'll probably give you most of the same content. Uh, Mark's, uh, Harper's was just my favourite. Uh, for a more general overview of cell biology, I would recommend a relatively obscure book, uh, Becker's World of the Cell. Um, not all of it is relevant to medicine. Um, it's, a, it's a bit more general biology, um, but it is really great for conceptual knowledge and it has excellent uh, diagrams. This is uh, one from glycolysis um, and I just found it very good for an understanding. Um, finally, I'd probably also look at some references from the world of exercise physiology. Uh, this textbook I had a look at, it was very, um, very useful in terms of bioenergetics. It's where I got a lot of the adenylyl charge concepts, as well as the hydraulic mod model that I featured in the presentation. Um, regarding the articles and books, um, articles in particular, you can find a lot of stuff online. Um, there's even ways to find access to books online if you if you um, know what you're looking for. Um, and that's it. Um, thanks for watching all the way through. I hope it improved your understanding of some of the concepts. I'm going to try and make more of these as I found it very useful for my study. I will aim for them to be a lot shorter and a bit more focused. The next one might be on physics and measurement, but we'll see. If you have any questions, corrections, or additional feedback, please comment below. If I got something wrong, I probably won't be able to edit the upload, but I'll be sure to put it in the description or a pinned comment. Also, let me know if you'd like me to add closed captions to the video. It's an option, but it does seem like a fair bit of work. I sort of want the audio to work well with the visual features on screen and not obscure the diagrams, but I do also want it to be accessible, so let me know. And um, until next time, bye.